Oasis Audio presents The Selfless Act, The Amish Millionaire, Part 6, by Wanda E. Brunstetter and Jean Brunstetter. Read for you by Rebecca Gallagher. Chapter 1. Millersburg, Ohio Joel smiled, glancing at the box full of red and green wrapped packages on the passenger seat beside him. He'd bought these gifts for his sisters, their husbands, and Aunt Verna and Uncle Lester. More packages in the back of his truck waited for his nieces and nephews. He hoped his generosity in bringing Christmas presents would be well received. What could be more selfless than buying Christmas gifts for 17 family members when I'm short on money, he thought. Thankfully, Joel had been able to borrow some money from his buddy, Tom Hunter, but of course, that meant one more obligation to pay. Joel still hadn't gotten all his subcontractors paid from jobs they'd done for him several months ago. He wondered if he'd ever be debt-free. Should be doing more than fine if I ever get my share of Dad's will, he mumbled, turning in the direction of his sister Elsie's house, where he'd been invited for Christmas dinner. If Elsie, Arlene, Doris, and Aunt Verna thought the gifts he'd brought for everyone qualified as a selfless act, before the day was out, he might get to open the envelope Dad had left for him. Guiding his truck onto the backcountry road leading to Elsie and John's place, Joel's hands began to sweat. What if Aunt Verna thinks the gifts I bought are superficial and not a selfless act? She does have the final say. And until she's convinced I've committed a selfless act, I'm not getting any of Dad's money. When Joel had apologized to his ex-girlfriend, Anna, for hurting her during their breakup more than seven years ago, his aunt hadn't seen it as a heartfelt, much less selfless deed. Aunt Verna could be tough, like Joel's dad. Stubborn, too. When she made up her mind about something, there was no changing it. Joel needed to keep on her good side. If he said enough nice things to his aunt today, and she liked the gifts he'd bought everyone, it might help his cause. Pulling into Elsie's driveway, Joel slammed on the brakes and did a double take. Oh, no! What happened? Joel undid his seatbelt and hopped out of the car. He almost pinched himself to see if he was in the middle of a nightmare. The smell of burned wood and ash made him cough. His sister's house was gone, burned to the ground. Joel's heart hammered in his chest as he got back in his truck and turned it around. I need to find Elsie, see if everyone's okay. Maybe they're at Arlene's. If not, then she may know why their house caught on fire and where they're staying. Farmerstown, Ohio After Joel pulled up to the barn by Arlene and Larry's house, he turned off the engine, hopped out, and raced up the porch steps. He'd only knocked once when the door opened and Doug stuck his head out. Where's your mother? I need to talk to her right away. She and my dad are at the hospital with Scott. Doug stared up at him with a curious expression. Joel's mouth hung slightly open. What's wrong with your brother? He pushed his hands deep into his pockets. Doug opened the door wider and stepped aside. You look cold. You'd better come in and we'll tell you about it. The icy air cut through Joel's boots, so he stomped the snow off his feet and did as the boy suggested. Anxious to know why Scott and his parents were at the hospital, Joel also wanted to find out if anyone knew about the fire that had destroyed his eldest sister's house. It didn't take long for him to ask, because Elsie and John, along with Uncle Lester and Aunt Verna, were seated on the living room sofa. The children, Martha, Mary, Hope, and Lillian, sat on the floor near the fireplace, while Glenn and Blaine occupied the two recliners. The somber expressions on what should have been a joyous Christmas afternoon revealed the depth of everyone's sorrow. Joel stood in front of the couch, looking down at them. He opened his mouth, but at first, nothing came out. He wasn't sure what to say. I, uh, just came from Millersburg and was stunned when I saw what little remains of your house. 
What happened, Elsie? Was anyone hurt? No. John's shoulders slumped. We were here last night, having supper with the rest of the family. And soon after Scott was taken to the hospital, we headed for home. He paused, rubbing his hand down one side of his bearded face. When we got there and saw our house engulfed in flames, I ran to the phone shack and called for help. Unfortunately, by the time the fire trucks came, our house was gone. Elsie's chin trembled. We have nothing left, Joel. Only the clothes on our back. She dabbed at her tear-filled eyes with a tissue. And the barn, Jean added. Fortunately, it's far enough from the house, so it didn't catch fire from any sparks. Of course, we can't live in the barn. Elsie's voice sounded strained, and she sniffed, rubbing her nose with the tissue. We don't know how long it'll be before we can afford to rebuild. You'd best wait till spring, when the weather is warmer, Uncle Lester interjected. By then, maybe a benefit auction can take place to help with your expenses. Aunt Verna nodded and clasped Elsie's hand. We're thankful none of you were inside when the fire started. Material possessions can be replaced, but lives cannot. Material possessions can't be replaced if you don't have money to replace them, Joel was tempted to retort. Knowing his sister and aunt wouldn't appreciate his thoughts, he kept them to himself. I'm sorry for your loss. He shifted his weight from one foot to the other. Do you know how the fire got started? John shook his head. Elsie's sure she didn't leave the stove on and didn't have a fire in the fireplace. I thought all the gas lamps were out before we left to come here to celebrate Christmas Eve, but I may have carelessly forgotten to turn one off. Joel rubbed the heel of his palm against his chest as he tried to calm his nerves. His sister and brother-in-law's situation was tragic, but there was nothing he could do to help them out. Given his own financial issues, he didn't have any extra cash to give them. He sank into the rocking chair across from them, and Doug knelt on the floor beside him. Do you want to hear about Scott now? The boy asked, looking up at Joel. Yes, I do. Joel focused his attention on Doug. He complained of a bellyache last night and started throwing up, so Dad called a driver and they took him to the hospital. It sounds like the flu to me. Why would they take him to the hospital for that? It wasn't the flu, Elsie's lips compressed. Scott was in so much pain, he couldn't even walk. When they got to the hospital, they found out his appendix had ruptured. Wow, is he going to be okay? Joel rubbed the bridge of his nose. I spoke with Arlene on the phone after Scott came out of surgery. He seemed to be doing all right but the doctor is worried about infection from the poison that was spread when it ruptured. Elsie sighed. If I could be at the hospital right now, I'd know more. Sitting here, thinking about the fire and worrying about Scott is taking its toll on me. She paused to wipe the tears on her cheeks with another tissue. This has not been a good Christmas for the Kinner or us adults. Where's Doris? Does she know about all this? Joel asked. I called and left a message on their answering machine this morning, John replied. I'm sure once they hear the news, they'll come over right away. I left a message for you too, Joel, but your mailbox was full. Yeah, sorry about that. I need to delete some messages. Joel stood up and tightened his fists. I want to find out how Scott's doing. He looked at Elsie. Do you know what hospital they took him to? Union, in Dover. Elsie stood too. Would you mind if I go with you? I'm sure Arlene could use some support. That's fine. 
I have a box of Christmas presents for everyone out in the truck. I'll bring them inside, and as soon as you're ready to go, we can be on our way. Berlin, Ohio Using one crutch under her arm for support, Doris stood at the stove, scrambling eggs. She'd been able to do a few more things on her own lately and wanted to have breakfast ready for Brian when he came in from doing chores. She finished the eggs and was about to put them in the oven to keep warm when Brian entered the kitchen. His grim expression let Doris know something was amiss. What's wrong? You look umgrant. I am upset, and you will be too when you hear this news. He removed his knitted cap and hung it on a wall peg, then took a seat at the table, motioning for Doris to do the same. What is it, Brian? You're scaring me. She hobbled across the room and lowered herself into the chair across from him. I stopped at the phone shack to check for messages and found one from John. Deep wrinkles formed across Brian's forehead. Their house caught fire last night. They lost everything. Doris's spine stiffened. She clutched the edge of the table. Ugh! That's Baremlik. Was anyone hurt? No, but there's nothing left of the house. John said they spent last night at Arlene and Larry's. I'm guessing that's where they still are. We ought to be with them. They need our support right now. Doris grabbed her crutch and started to stand. Let's eat breakfast first. I, I don't think I can. She felt as if a lump was stuck in her throat. I feel sick about this. Same here. Brian drew in a deep breath. There's more, Doris. W what do you mean? When Larry and Arlene took Scott to the hospital last night, they found out his appendix had ruptured. Oh, no. She covered her mouth and fell back in her chair, dropping her crutch to the floor. Lord, why are so many terrible things happening to our family? She prayed. How much more can we take? Dover, Ohio Elsie stood in the hospital waiting room, sobbing as she hugged her sister. What a horrible Christmas this has turned out to be for all of us. Arlene's tears wet Elsie's dress as she gently patted her back. I'm so sorry to hear of your loss. I can't imagine how it must feel to have lost your home and everything in it. It's a small thing compared to the loss of a loved one. I hope and pray Scott's going to be okay. Same here. Joel stepped up to them. The little guy doesn't deserve this. Loss and illness are hard, Larry said. But with God's help and with support from each other, we'll all get through this. I brought him a gift, but it's at your house. Guess I can give it to him when he gets home. Joel glanced down the hall. I don't suppose he's up to company yet. Larry shook his head. He's sleeping and needs his rest. Let's sit down and visit while we're waiting for him to wake up. Arlene drew in her bottom lip. I'll sit a few minutes, but then I'm going back to his room. I want to be there when he wakes up. Elsie and Arlene sat beside each other while the men pulled up chairs facing them. You're welcome to stay at our house for as long as you like. Arlene lightly stroked Elsie's forearm as she spoke in a quiet tone. But it might work better for your family if you moved into Dad's old place until you're able to rebuild. There's more room there, and you can all spread out. True, but Aunt Verna and Uncle Lester are staying there now, as well as Glenn. Elsie massaged the back of her neck, contemplating things. Once they return to their home in Burton, John and I can take the downstairs bedroom, which would free one of the upstairs rooms so Blaine and Glenn wouldn't have to share anymore. 
it was difficult to look at the positives right now, but bemoaning their situation wouldn't change a thing. They would have to make the best of their situation and be grateful they had a warm place to stay. Joel glanced at his cell phone and scratched his jaw. The Weather Channel has issued a warning of a snowstorm that will hit the area within the next hour. He turned to Elsie. I think we should go now, before the roads get real bad, or we could end up stuck here overnight. You two go ahead. I'm not going anywhere until I'm sure Scott's out of danger, Arlene was quick to say. Larry and I spent last night here, and we'll stay as long as needed. That's right, her husband agreed. Arlene offered Elsie a tired-looking smile as she leaned her back against the chair. Donkey for bringing Larry and me a change of clothes. You're welcome. I feel bad you'll have to spend another night trying to sleep in a chair when you ought to be home in your own bed. We'll be okay, Larry stood. I'm going to the vending machine to get some coffee. Would anyone else like some? He looked at Joel. Maybe you'd like a cup for the road. No, that's okay. Vending machine coffee's not for me. I like mine fresh. Elsie made no comment as she slipped on her outer garments. She wished she could stay at the hospital with Arlene, but John and the children were waiting for her. After the trauma they'd all been through on Christmas Eve, her place was with them.